Okay, Whew, great. To, technical difficulties, that's okay. Lord's in control. Um, continuing through the book of Matthew this morning. Um, but before we do, let's pray again together. Lord, we just do thank you for your friendship, God, and um, a friend when, Lord, no one else is, a friend when we need you the most, a friend who will never fail us. God, what a precious gift that there is, that that is. God, I pray that you would help us now as we think about your word, as we think about the book of Matthew, God, and as we kind of really start coming to the end of the book of Matthew and the, the difficulties that you faced and the, your strange providence, God, and how you fulfilled all, the, all of your promises and even how Israel, God, was hard-hearted. But, Lord, you gave your son to save us. God, just help us to understand these things. Guard us, from, guard us God, from unbelief and help us to see you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 22. And um, the title of this sermon is called Questioning Christ Part 2. We talked about Questioning Christ Part 1 yesterday. But in, this, in this, uh, these passages here, they're, they're putting Jesus to the test, right? They're, they're, they're asking him questions, but <laughs> they're obviously not sincere, right? They're trying to pin him into a corner. They're trying to trap him in his words, Okay, but Jesus is too wise for that, right? He, he perfectly embodies um, what it means to be um, as shrewd as a serpent, but innocent as a dove. And so they're, they're pressing him with these questions. Maybe you've questioned God before. Maybe you've had some questions to him before. Maybe they were sincere questions. Or maybe like these fellas, they weren't sincere, but regardless, Jesus has answers. And if we'll listen carefully, we'll be able to see who he really is. And that's the key, right? Because the, the, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were so blinded by their own jealousy, by their own greed, by their own status as the spiritual leadership in Israel, that the thought that somebody like Jesus, who wasn't part of their tribe, who didn't, who didn't follow their rules, how could he come and claim to be? The Messiah, okay? So this is, this, is the, the, this is what Jesus is entering into today as we talk about questioning Christ part two. And what we're going to see and what Jesus is going to explain, we're going to talk about the greatest commandment and the greatest Lord. The greatest commandment and the greatest Lord from Matthew chapter 22. And so if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34. It says... Verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Uh, when they gathered, um, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The word of God. You may be seated. So we're going to talk about the greatest commandment and the greatest Lord, the greatest commandment and the greatest Lord. So we're walking through Matthew, and we've seen for quite some time now that 
Jesus' final days are characterized by the opposition that he faced, okay? So if you, just, if you just kind of flip the pages in your Bible, what you'll see here is that chapter 22, as we're talking about with these questions, serve as kind of the, the climactic confrontation between Jesus and the religious establishment, okay? Because then in chapter 23, if you peek over there, you'll see that Jesus says some of the most harshest words that he ever speaks that are recorded in the Bible as he pronounces woes upon the religious leaders. Okay, and we're going to talk about that soon. And then, and that, and that chapter, chapter 23, concludes with Jesus weeping over Jerusalem because of the hardness of heart of the people and the judgment that's going to come upon them. Climaxing in, the, um, in AD 70, where Jerusalem would be raised to, the, raised to the ground by the Roman army. And this is picked up in chapter 24, where Jesus, weeping about Jerusalem, says to his disciples, you, they were marveling at the, the, the unbelievable building, the, the temple complex that Herod had built, okay, just uh, w- would have been one of, the, one of the wonders of the world. Okay, just beautiful, huge temple mount structure and, and um, just kind of area there. And Jesus said, do you see that right there? Not one stone will be left upon another. And that leads them, something in their mind, that cataclysmic could only, be, could only mark the, <laughs> it really could only mark the end of the world. What, 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 in their minds, what could possibly do something like that? And, and what could bring such severe punishment upon God's own people? And that leads him into chapter 24 where he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and also about the very end of the world and the final judgment. Okay. So last week, we talked about um, the unbelief of the Jewish leaders. They're questioning him. Okay. And so they asked him these challenging questions about uh, the taxes, about marriage. Okay. And today he's challenged with the question about the great commandment. Now, apparently this is quite, this was quite a debated uh, topic in Jesus's day. And he's answered it before in other places. Okay. But Jesus's answer is that the greatest commandment in the law is that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Now, as Christians, you know, especially if you've been raised in the church, if you've read your Bible uh, through a couple times, this is obvious. This seems very obvious to you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But you have to remember that it's a really important question, especially for Jewish people, right? Because they kept the Old Testament law. There are over 600 commands in the law. And because God gave the law, they're inclined, as we all would be, to say, well, all the commands are important, right? So it's not just, it's not just kind of an off-the-wall question, an obvious question. Because there are so many commandments in the Old Testament law, it's quite natural to ask, well, are some more important than others? And Jesus actually answers yes. In different places, he talks about how there, there's the weightier commandments of the law. Because one of the problems of the Pharisees with their hypocrisy, right, is that they would keep the tiny details of the law, uh, the tiny details, and miss the most important parts of the law. And so Jesus is saying there are weightier parts of the law. And so if you keep the details without keeping the more important parts, then you're wasting your time. And so, and so with all these laws, it's natural for people to want a way to simplify things. Which is the most important commandment? Okay? And Jesus says, The great and first commandment is that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. In other words, Jesus is saying that this command sums up everything. If you do this, you will fulfill the rest of the law. That's that's a lot easier than remembering 600 laws, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So I want you to notice this here. At the heart of the law, so we look back at the law as Christians, and even as modern day people, we look back at the law, 
the Old Testament law, and you go back and you your favorite book, Leviticus, okay, and you read the book of Leviticus, somebody got that, and you read the book of Leviticus, and you read all these laws, and, and in modern day people, we read that, and if we don't think, we think it's, we, we, lots of them things are weird at most, and some of them, in fact, make us quite uncomfortable. Go back and read it. You say, so this, this is, I don't understand this. This doesn't make sense. Okay? But what Jesus is saying, that behind all the laws of the Old Testament is this. Love. Love is behind the law. Love is behind the law. The, so, so, Jesus saw that there were some things more important, right? Just take the Ten Commandments, right? God gave them all these other commandments, but he only wrote ten of them on stone. Right? And many commentators over the years, it's virtually, I mean, virtually everybody agrees that the rest of the laws that God gives are little more than elaborations on the Ten Commandments. Because you have the Ten Commandments and then everything else is kind of comes up under the Ten Commandments. Okay? In the same way, there's one thing underneath them all, and that is the law of love. Now, now listen to this. This is maybe the most important thing I'll say today. Our greatest obligation as creatures is not to do something, but to love someone. Let me say that again. Our greatest obligation as creatures is not to do something, but to love someone. That's the first and great commandment. Why is that so important? Because we are prone to, and many people misconstrue Christianity as just a bunch of rules. But that's not what Christianity is. Christianity, it has rules, but it's not about rules. It's about love. What Jesus said is the greatest thing that we are to do is not even really a, a, a rule to keep. It's, it's to love God. And when you love God, everything else is going to fall into place. This must reframe, reframe our understanding of the law. And this was not just true in, now that we have Jesus. It was true in the Old Testament, right? When God came to Abraham, what had Abraham done for God? Nothing. In fact, in the book of Joshua, it says that Abraham was an idolater like everybody else. Till God showed up and chose him out of all the people on the earth, he chose Abraham. Why? Because he loved him. And he gave him a promise. Abraham didn't deserve it, but he gave him a promise. Go into this land, I will show you. I will, I will make you great. I will make your name great. I will make your offspring as the sand of the, of the, of the sea, as the stars in the heavens. And I'll give you this land. Why? Because Abraham deserved it? No, because God loved him. And then, in fulfillment of that promise, what happened? Well, he, he delivered the family of, of Abraham through Joseph, right? Who went down into Egypt. And then eventually they ended up in slavery. But through that, God actually fulfills his promise because they greatly multiplied in Egypt as God promised that they would. And then at the appointed time, God delivered them from slavery out of Egypt through the, through the Passover, through the going through the Red Sea. He delivered them salvation of uh, of the people of God, of Abraham, he saved them. The Passover and the Exodus become the great picture in the Bible of salvation. He saves them. And then he gives them the law. In other words, he saved them before he ever told them what they needed to do. And it's the same way with us. We don't clean up ourselves in order for God to love us. When we realize that God loves us, he saves us, and then he cleans us up. And then he says, now that you belong to me, here's what a person who belongs to me lives like. He saved them before he gave them the law. He made a covenant. The law is called the covenant, the old covenant, the covenant at Mount Sinai. And you have to remember that a covenant is not first and foremost about rules. A covenant is first and foremost about relationship which is what Christianity is about. 
Okay? Because, I mean, the, again, I always talk about marriage because it's the only, it's really about the only thing that we have today that is, is close enough. Okay? But in marriage, did you know that marriage has rules? Amen. Marriage has rules. There are certain things you should and shouldn't do when you're married. Right? What is that? That's rules. Now, I need to love my wife. I need to provide for my family. I need to be kind and gentle and gracious. I need to be disciplined and self-control. I need to be faithful. Right? Those are rules. But, but, but the, what, the point of the rules is what? The point of the covenant is what? Meg and I made a covenant. We're married. Okay? The rules do what? The rules protect the relationship. You see what I'm saying? The marriage covenant is not about the rules. I didn't get married so that I could follow rules. I got married so that I could be with Meg. I keep the rules of marriage. I'm faithful to my marriage. Why? So that I can be with Meg. Because what happens if I violate the rules of marriage? It, it breaks the relationship. It breaks the covenant. But what is it first about? It's not about rules. It's about relationship. The covenant that God gave them on Mount Sinai, all those rules, wasn't about, hey, keep all these rules. It was saying, you do this so you can be with me. Because if you don't do this, it breaks our relationship. It breaks the covenant. Relationship, covenant is about relationship. What, what, if, I, what if I entered into my marriage and says, oh, I got to be faithful today. You ain't got a good marriage. But guess what? If you love your spouse, you say, of course I'm going to be faithful. I love my wife. I want to be with her. I don't want to violate that relationship. In the same way, I don't say, oh, I got I to gotta, I gotta read my Bible today. No, I want to be with God. So what does these rules matter if, if it means I get to be with God? It's a small price to pay to be in relationship with God. And there's even more we can say. Because God has created us, we're already obligated to him. If he did nothing else, the fact that he made us means that he owns us. But not only that, is that he's treated us with unbelievable grace. All of us. Such, such that we, everyone has a moral obligation to love God. Let me put it this way. Some things are so right that it is a sin to think they're wrong. Some things are so good it is a sin to think they're bad. God is so lovely, so worthy, more than anything else that exists, that it's a sin not to love him. And when Jesus says, love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's just, that's just a way to say that we love him with everything, all of you for all of God. Now think about how much you have and who you are, and think about how much God has and who God is. And, Jesus, and God makes you this offer. All you have to give me is all of you, but then you get all of me. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's all of us for all of God. Now notice, you know, sometimes we say we have to love God more than anything else, and that's true. But we have to be careful not to sometimes our uh, sinful minds try to play word games. When it says love God more than anything else, we're not saying you only have to give God 51%. Of your love. Or only even 99% of your love. There is not the tiniest fraction of our lives that doesn't owe its total love and allegiance to God. You know, again, on a wedding day, what if we got married and say, I promise to love you with 51% more than any other woman. It's not going to fly. Or even 85%. In the same way, God is worthy of all of our love. 
It's what he's due. So we can say, God, help me love you with all that I am. And then Jesus also says the second commandment. And so the second flows from the first, right? If we love God with all our heart, everything else flows down from that, right? Of course, if God made everybody, then to love God is to love other people because they belong to him. So the first takes care of the second. But the second is important because it helps us put legs on what it means to love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's always very interesting. I've thought it always very interesting. But it's also genius because God actually appeals to our natural sense of self-preservation and selfishness, if you will, to teach us how to love other people. How much do you love yourself? Probably a lot. My guess is you do more for you than... <laughs> I mean, we do a lot. We, preserve, we, we do things to preserve ourselves. We love ourselves. And Jesus is saying... Jesus doesn't... I mean, he calls out selfishness. He's not talking about selfishness, but his, his point is as much as you love yourself, that's how much you should love other people. And so it makes it super, it makes it super easy then what it means to love. If you want somebody... To not do something to you, don't do it to them. If you you would want somebody to do something for you, do it for them. And And so then, when we look at God's commands, okay, when we look at God's commands, they're undergirded by love. So all these rules that were in the Old Testament that the Jews had to keep, and all the commands in the New Testament that Jesus tells us to keep, okay, and even some of the controversial ones, right, about sexuality, gender identity, things that are very controversial today, things that, <clears throat> things that for some people today, they don't make sense. The Bible seems old-fashioned, outdated, and backwards to them. But even those, the Bible says undergirding all these things is love. So in other words, if we want to love people like God has commanded us to love, and he says, love your neighbor as yourself, then, what lo- then the God's commands do what? They tell us what love looks like. If you want to love your neighbor, this is how you to love them. So notice here, it's not... <clears throat> so when it says love your neighbor as yourself, it means love that is informed by the wisdom and the truth of God. All right? It doesn't just mean... And why, why do I say that? Because it can be misconstrued. Right? It can be misconstrued, right? I could say, oh, love your neighbor as yourself. Well... Um, if I were me, I would want, um, you know, uh, you know, anybody could say, well, I just want, I just want this. I just want that. When what they want might be a sin. So then a loving act on my part would not be to give them what they wanted, right? Because then that would be sin. In other words, love is informed by God's truth and by God's word. It's not just a blanket, uh, give people whatever they want. Love your neighbor as yourself is love that is informed by the the word and the truth of God. And God's command teaches us how to love. But it is important, as we think about the golden rule here, love your neighbor as yourself. If you were in that person's shoes, mindful of the teaching and wisdom of God, how would you want somebody in, in that position to treat you? Let me say that again. If you were in another per- that person's shoes, being mindful of the teaching and wisdom of God, how would you want somebody in that, in that position to treat you? If that's, that, that question can teach you how to love your neighbor. When you see a need, right, when, you see, when you encounter somebody and you say, what does it mean to love this person? You can ask them, if I was in their shoes in accordance with the truth and wisdom of God, what would it mean to look like to love this person? Uh, the, the thing that comes to mind right now is the Good Samaritan. Okay? Now think about the Good Samaritan. You had the priest and the Levite. They walked by. Have you ever thought about why they walked by? We could, maybe we say things like they're too busy. Maybe we could just say things like they were just hard-hearted and didn't want to deal with it. But you know, I think a part of it that sometimes we miss is this. For all they knew, he was dead. And did you know that biblically speaking, Jews were not supposed to touch dead bodies because it was considered unclean? So do you know why they, they probably didn't help the man? Because they cared more about 
their ritual purity than they did about helping somebody. In other words, just like the Pharisees, they were keeping the tiniest details while they were missing the whole point. This calls us to ask a different question. This calls us to ask a different question. If I were them, what would be the right way to help them? The best way to help them? Put yourselves in their shoes. And then you love your neighbor as yourself, which is exactly what the Good Samaritan did. So we see, number one, he had the greatest commandment. And number two, we see the greatest Lord. So this is the final question. The final question that they put Jesus to. And Jesus, as he does, he asks, he asks, um, well, okay, so Jesus' final question. So after them, them questioning him, he questions them. And so he's like, okay, okay, you've, you've asked me, now it's my turn. So they question him, so he questions them. And he's given all these brilliant answers. And he asks them a question, they have nothing to say. It said, he said, what do you think about the Christ? Because that, that's the question, right? That, that's the thing that they're denying about Jesus. That's why they're putting him to the test. That's why they're trying to trap him in his words. Because they understand that his, basically what he is claiming is he's claiming to be the Christ, right? He, he enters in Jer- Jerusalem on a donkey, right? That was a, that was a kingly sign of, of, of coming into their city, okay? He's claiming to be the Christ. They deny his uh, messiahship, okay? And so for this final question, he asked them, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. And so, Jesus puts this question to them, okay? Now, when he says, when he asks them about the Christ, whose son is he? You, You just have to remember... Okay, when we say Jesus Christ, Christ is not Jesus' last name, right? Just make sure you remember that, right? It's not Jesus' last name. It's a title. Christ means Messiah. Christ means anointed one, okay? Uh, Mashiach in Hebrew, okay? It was, the one, it was the one who was anointed by God because in the Old Testament, there's these prophecies of one who is anointed by God. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, kings and, and kings... Priests and prophets were, were anointed, okay, in, in various circumstances, okay? But there was these prophecies about an, a, an anointed one, okay, who would be the Messiah, the Christ, the King of Israel, the one to bring about the fulfillment of God's promises. There was diversity in Israel about what the Messiah would be like, but many, is quite clear that many had the expectation of, a, of this great Jewish king, right, who would throw off Roman oppression and who would make Israel great, okay? And, and make it the greatest of all nations, kind of very earthly, worldly perception of the Messiah, which is going to happen one day, by the way, slightly different than they anticipated. But the prophets in David's, uh, long after David's day, so we have David, and most of them understood that the Messiah would be an heir of David, okay? And the prof and there's reason for this is because the prophets, even long after David was gone, prophesied about it. Let me read you a couple of them. Isaiah chapter eleven. It says, "There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit." Now, who's Jesse? Who's Jesse? David's dad was named Jesse. When it says a shoot will come from the stump, right? There's this, kind of, there's this kind of interesting picture there of even David's line being cut off in a sense, but then somebody's going to pop out. A shoot from the stump of Jesse is going to come, Isaiah says. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. 
the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see. Jesus said that in John. He says, I do not judge on my own. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or dispute or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. So we have this image of this person, this heir of David, who is going to be anointed with the Holy Spirit. Okay, who's going to be full of the spirit. Now, remember, in in the Old Testament, there wasn't a lot of this, the Spirit's activity that we read about is usually kind of rare and spontaneous. But it's prophesying of a day of a person who's going to come, who's going to be continually filled with the Spirit. And he's going to be righteous in all that he does. He's going to be the judge of the earth. Jeremiah prophesies similarly in Jeremiah 23. He says, Behold, the days are coming declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. There's that imagery again. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And so there's no surprise that the Jews understood that the Messiah would be an heir and descendant of David. And that's what, they, that's what Jesus asked them, right? The Christ, what do you think? Whose son will he be? Well, he's the son of David. But then Jesus pops them with Psalm 110. The Psalm that I read earlier in the service. Psalm 110 was understood by many Jews to be messianic. That is, pointing towards the Messiah. And uh, as I read it earlier, and maybe if you've read it before, when you read Psalm 110, it's kind of strange, strange psalm. Lots of weird stuff going on in there. Okay? But notice what David, notice what Jesus says. He says, David wrote it in the Spirit. So first of all, note that Jesus believed in the inspiration of the Old Testament. It didn't just say, Jesus has a high view of the Old Testament. So if you, don't, if you believe Jesus in the New Testament, you have to believe the Old Testament. Because Jesus said, David wrote in the Spirit. Okay? They, Jesus believed in the inspiration of the Old Testament. And he said, David in the Spirit wrote Psalm 110. Now again, this psalm, David lived about a thousand years before Jesus. Okay? And Psalm 110 is, if I remember correctly, it's one of the the most, if not the most, quoted Old Testament passage in the entire New Testament. That's how important it is. We probably don't think about Psalm 110 much, but it's one of the most quoted Old Testament passages in the entire New Testament. Okay? And in fact, in verse, in verse 4 of Psalm 110 that I read earlier, it says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, you were a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, what in the world does that mean? Well, if you go back, you read this psalm, and you read that verse about Melchizedek. So, in this psalm, what is it? It says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And you go on, and you read, and then it says, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, as you read Psalm 110, you see what is happening is that David, in the Spirit, is it's almost like he's eavesdropping on a heavenly conversation, right? And he sees God, and God is talking to this other figure who is unbelievably great. So great that all the enemies is going to be put under his feet. And so great that God tells this other figure, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So David in the spirit is like overhearing this divine conversation. Now what is the Melchizedek? Melchizedek has to do with anything. If you go to the book of Hebrews, there's literally an entire section in the book of Hebrews that talks about how Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Why is that so weird and crazy? And I think this is the only other place in the Bible besides Genesis that mentions Melchizedek. Melchizedek is this obscure figure in the book of Genesis when Lot was captured and taken away. Um, Abraham goes and scrounges up an army, goes and saves Lot, 
and gets the spoils of war and gives 10% of all that all, all the spoils to, Mel, to a guy named Melchizedek who just shows up out of nowhere. We don't know who Melchizedek is. We don't know where he came from. We don't know anything about him. All we know is that in the book of Genesis, we read these strange words that he was a king and that he was priest of Most High God. That's all it says. Melchizedek is this strange, mysterious figure who was what? Who was a priest and a king. And, a, and Abraham, the greatest man in the Old Testament, tithes to him. That's strange. It's weird. It's mysterious. And then, way in the future, God is t- telling this mysterious figure in David's hearing, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus shows up on the scene and talking and referencing Psalm 110 and essentially saying, that's talking about me. I'm a priest and I'm a king. I am the king, I am the heir of David, and I'm the priest, I'm the ultimate priest of God because I offer my own life as a sacrifice for the sins of my people. So Jesus is this, Jesus is this great person. But the the question, the question stumps them because of this, right? David is like seeing this heavenly vision, okay? Okay. He's eavesdropping on this divine conversation. When? A thousand years before Jesus was was born, right? And yet he says what? The Lord said to my Lord. So David is calling this other person my Lord. The Lord God, that is God, the Lord God says to my Lord, this other person, and David calls him Lord. So, So there was a person that David was calling Lord while David was still alive. How could that person be David's son? I don't know. It is confusing, isn't it? How could, that, how could a person that David called Lord while he was still alive be his son? David wouldn't call one of his own sons Lord. The reason is because <laughs> there's somebody greater than they could possibly... Remember, David was the greatest king Israel ever had. And what does David do? He calls this other person Lord. Who is this person? Well, if he's greater than David, then he's the greatest person the world has ever known. Because David calls him Lord. And so we we see this insight into this question. Now notice Jesus doesn't answer the question. Jesus Jesus says, how could he be his son? And they, they couldn't answer it. And Jesus doesn't answer it. Why? Because he's looking at them. It's me. Right? That's why if we go all the way back to the beginning of Matthew, right? It says the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And he will be called the son of God. Why is this person so great? Because he's not just the son of David. He's the son of God. He, he, was, he is greater than David because he came because he was before David. Just as he was before John the Baptist. Okay? Jesus came on the scene and he said things like, before Abraham was, I am. He said things like, the queen of Sheba came from the far reaches of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, someone greater than Solomon is here. Jesus said things like, behold, the Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, someone greater then Jonah is here. You see, the, they kept putting Jesus to the test because they refused to see who Jesus was. And so the question that this passage is point, putting to us and the question that I put to all of us this morning is this. Do you really see who Jesus is? He's not just another dude. You see, they just thought he was just another dude, and they just questioned him. Where do you get this authority? Who are you, dude? Who do you think you are? And a lot of people say that, right? A lot of people people say that about the Christians or the Bible. They'll say, well, who do you think you are to say about this, this, and this, and we can't do this, 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 and I want to do this, this, this. And Jesus just says, I'm greater than Solomon. Before Abraham was, I am. That's who I am. 
We can either see it or not, but that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the king. All his enemies will be put under his feet. It's not an if, it's a when. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. God is patient. God is merciful. God is long-suffering. The reason why so much sin happens in the world and people aren't immediately struck down by thunderbolts is because God is patient and merciful and kind and loving. And he gives people plenty of time to repent. But do not mistake the mercy of God for weakness. Because every enemy will be put under his feet. One day he's coming back and he's going to deal with sin. And if you do not turn and trust in him and believe in him and you have to stand in your own sin on that day rather than having your sins forgiven through him, you're going to be in big trouble. Trouble that you can't escape. He is the king He's a good king. He's a gracious king. But he's the king. It's better to trust him now, to bend the knee to him now, to serve him now, than to be broken later. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We can surrender now and rejoice on that day when he comes back for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd help us. Help me, God. Help us to not, to not miss who you are, Lord. Lord, if somebody like David called you Lord, how could I not? Help us, Lord, to see you for who you are. Don't let us miss it. God, help us love and serve and fear and trust you today. And Lord, maybe there's someone in here this morning who hasn't truly surrendered their heart, their life to you. Lord, who right now is wrestling, God, of loving you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, I pray that by your Spirit, um, you would tear down the walls. That they might see you for who you are. That they might see that there is nothing, nothing worth, nothing better than, than knowing you. There is no price too high to pay to be with you. Oh God, I pray you would help them see it and help us see it too. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song of decision. It's a great time right now to respond to the Lord. Maybe there's something, maybe there's something that um, has been detracting from your love for God. It's a great time to lay it down. Maybe you need to know Jesus Christ. I'd love to talk with you about it. Whatever the Lord has spoken to you, please respond. Let's all stand as we sing.